Good evening and welcome back to CNN Money Switzerland and our ongoing coverage of coronavirus. I'm Olivia Chang. Now, the Swiss government has said that it will extend the coronavirus lockdown until April 26th. After that, it will then work on a plan to gradually loosen restrictions. More details to come next week, but this is the latest so far that we have from the Swiss Federal Council and their press conference today. There are now further signs that coronavirus and the situation is stabilizing across the country. The number of positive cases increased by less than 600 for the third day in a row. There are now about 22,700 people that have tested positive to the virus in Switzerland and 705 people have died. Credit card companies have increased the limit on contactless payments in Switzerland and in Liechtenstein to help reduce the risk of infection and spread of coronavirus. Post Finance, as well as American Express, MasterCard and Visa all said that the limit before entering a PIN would now be increased from 40 to 80 Swiss francs. Keep in mind this applies to all contactless payments, whether that be credit, debit or prepaid card. Now, small companies and self-employed persons will benefit from rent reductions following announcements this Wednesday by two key insurers in Switzerland. Swiss Life, which is the largest property owner across the country, said reductions will be in addition to deferred rental payments. Meanwhile, Hevetia is granting rent-free periods and reductions in addition to deferrals. Small businesses and those who are self-employed are particularly affected by the lockdown measures brought in during the coronavirus. And finally, fragrance and flavour making Givaudan is weathering the crisis after posting a more than 5% rise in first quarter sales. This was boosted by sales of snacks, beverages and personal care items. However, its fine fragrances businesses did fall short in March as many retail stores closed their doors due to the coronavirus outbreak. And just looking over to Europe now, talks over a half a trillion euro rescue package for the Eurozone broke down today after finance ministers failed to come to an agreement over what conditions should be attached to a potential deal. Talks will resume again tomorrow. Stocks slumped and 10-year Italian bond yields jumped to its highest in a year as a daily death toll rose again in some of the worst hit parts of Europe. Our top story tonight, the Swiss Hotel Association is predicting that 5% of all the hotels across the country will not be able to survive the pandemic. And I spoke to the president earlier today and he's saying that that roughly translates to about 250 hotels. Take a listen to what he had to say. Andreas, first of all, welcome to the program. You're not only the president of the Swiss Hotels Association, you also run your own hotel in Lenzerheide. Just tell us, what has your personal experience been through this whole coronavirus shock? Yeah, we had uh, the best winter se season since uh, 20 years because everything was perfect. Uh, the Christmas days, then January and February with new records in our hotel, with new revenue records and, and a lot of guests and happy guests. Uh, snow was perfect. So, and we had to really to close middle of, of March from one day to the other, because at the end we had only six guests in our hotel. And uh, then we decided to, to close the hotel four weeks earlier than, than planned. Uh, we had uh, planning to to uh, 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 Eastern to open to head uh, open the hotel like every year. You've actually predicted a bankruptcy wave to come from coronavirus. How many hotels do you think in Switzerland will not be able to survive this period? So that the normal. Uh, uh, number of, of hotels who close forever really definitely close not bankruptcy definitely definitely closed is one to two percent that means about 40 to 50 uh, hotels that these are normally re really small hotels in peripheral uh, regions in the mountains in valleys somewhere uh, on the on the countryside these are really small hotels with maybe 10 or 15 rooms. So we calculate for 50 to 60 hotels who close every year, definitely. And this year, what will the number look like approximately? Yeah, if I calculate this 20% uh, this year, I think it will raise to 5%. That means about 200, 250 hotels who close really forever because uh, they can survive this shock of the Corona crisis. Just talk to me about the revenue 
losses that we are seeing with no tourists coming in with all the travel restrictions what do the months from march all the way to say over the summer look like <laughs> the, yeah the whole summer is a little bit difficult to calculate but we have uh, also uh, uh, asked this question to to our members and uh, we can calculate more or less the the the, the facts is that uh, the the loss the loss of uh, middle of March until end of May is about 2 billion Swiss francs. And if you calculate uh, uh, for the whole year, it, we have, uh, expect, we expect uh, a loss of, of revenue, six and a half to seven billion Swiss francs. That means 25, 20 to 25% of the revenue for the whole year, for the whole hotel hospitality uh, industry in Switzerland. In your view, is the coronavirus crisis the worst the Swiss hotel industry has ever faced beyond the Swiss franc euro shock back in 2015? Yeah, I was already president in 2015 with the euro shock, and I, I did uh, that moment. I thought that uh, was the, the the worst thing who can happen uh, ever for the for our industry. But if I compare this coronavirus. Uh, 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 crisis with the uh, euro, the euro crisis is nothing against that. That really, as I think, the, the whole industry has never seen uh, something like that uh, we have now. Let's actually take a quick look into what could happen in the future. How long do you think Swiss hotels will need before they can recover and return back to normal? I think the, the international market is dead for the whole year. They will they will come back this year uh, again. The, the 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 business traveler they they stay at, at least the whole year at home. I think that we we can recover a little bit on a very low level. Next year we can start again in a normal modus, but on a very low uh, level. So it takes at least at least one year before we can start again with a, with a more or less normal level uh, in the hotel industry. A Swiss diagnostics company says that it can run approximately 3,000 coronavirus antibody tests in just a day on one of its new screening machines being released next week. My colleague Anna Maria Montero has all the latest details. So you can effectively do 3,000 antibody tests a day, is that what I'm hearing? Yes, per instrument, per one inst per one single instrument. And if you have multiple instruments, of course, uh, you can uh, do more. Talk to me about the actual instrument that you are using to make these tests, the Mosaic. Yeah, so Mosaic is a system. It's a, a multimodality microarray multiplexing technology. So the tests are on these very little microarrays, the size, the size of a razor blade. So it's basically a lab on the chip. And uh, you need an instrument to run uh, those uh, microarrays. Uh, there are about uh, 3,000 microarrays which can be processed uh, per day on a mosaic instrument. It will take about 35 minutes uh, to get the first results. And then every 24 seconds, you get every subsequent result. So it's a very high throughput, fully automated system. And how accurate is it? Uh, well, 100% is very accurate, yeah, and uh, talking uh, to customers, they say, well, <laughs> everything in this neighborhood, uh, 95, 97, 98, 99% uh, would be a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous help. But we are very confident uh, that we have a high accurate test here. We just can't make any claim before we have the CE mark. So if, if you had, we were thinking strategically now where to put these machines, where would you put them at the moment? Where could they do the most, benefit the most? Yeah, I think it's uh, hospital, university labs and uh, reference, uh, reference labs. And what kind of investment does this represent for the user, for the hospital? I mean, they have to buy the instrument and then also buy the chips in addition to this. What does that look like for them? Yeah, uh, the plan is uh, to sell the test uh, depending on the uh, volume uh, between 15 and uh, $25 per test for the laboratory. And uh, the instrument will be made available at cost or maybe another mechanism like uh, leasing it, uh, depending on the customer contract we have. So it's very specific uh, on the circumstances. What customer, for how long, 
what kind of volume. But I guess the point is that if they, in order to use the instrument, they also have to use the chips that you manufacture, right? It's like a, it's almost like an espresso machine where you buy the machine, but you also have to buy the specific capsules that go with it. Yes, absolutely. It's a razor, razor blade uh, business. Uh, so the instrument will be the coffee machine and uh, the capsules would be the micro arrays. And uh, the technology is in the micro arrays. Lots of testing going on out there for the virus these days but you are testing the antibody. Yes, absolutely. If you have antibody tests, uh, you can uh, identify those which are already immune and can go back safely and work. And you know uh, who might need a vaccine once a vaccine uh, becomes uh, available. So there are multiple reasons uh, to use ant antibody testing. Um, I think even for the development of a vaccine, it would be very important uh, to see whether the vaccine is actually working and in response to it, you develop antibodies or not. Uh, also, the identification of patients in high risk cohorts, like uh, with an underlying uh, morbidity and other individuals which would require vaccination. So it's for the vaccination strategy is to validate the vaccination is to check who had it before and has, is now immune and can they go back to work or not. Uh, so there are multiple uh, applications. And I think uh, also for healthcare professionals or other individuals with significant potential exposure, it would be very important to know. And for the global economy, do you see that? And Yes, I think, uh, yeah, and in, instead of a shotgun principle and uh, everybody has to stay home, uh, you can be much more uh, selective and targeted in your strategies. Now, interestingly enough, you were in Singapore during the SARS outbreak as the Asia Pacific president for Rosh Diagnostics. So is this a bit just um, coming? I mean, are you reliving this situation? What lessons did you learn then that you can bring to your work now? Yeah. So I, back then, I thought that I would never see such a, such a situation uh, again. But you're right. Back then, I initiated a research collaboration between Roche and uh, the Genome Institute of Singapore and John Hopkins of Singapore. And we provided relatively quickly a PCR test uh, for uh, screening. And uh, so the lesson learned was that in such a crisis, you have to come with diagnostics and uh, with uh, transparency who has and who is not infected uh, relatively quickly. Uh, the faster you have transparency, the easier it is uh, to manage the overall uh, situation. If we look towards the future, is this technology mm -hmm. also applicable to other medical issues? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, our starting point is transfusion diagnostics. So that's blood donation and patients receiving the blood donation, where you have to do multiple tests across multiple instruments. And we are talking about immunohematology, serological disease screening, but also molecular disease screening. And everything can be simplified and put on one single technology. Today, they have to work with at least four instruments and a lot of manual work. So that's a, a very good application right there. Another step would be into the plasma industry. They have similar requirements uh, to transfusion diagnostics. And of course, you can also apply it in the wider in vitro diagnostic market, especially for immunoassay and mole molecular disease screening, like we do it now with uh, COVID-19. And this is like a 40 billion central lab uh, opportunity where there are selected uh, applications which are making sense for this technology. Japan on Tuesday declared a month-long state of emergency after seeing a recent sharp rise in the number of coronavirus cases in Tokyo. CNN's Will Ripley reports on how the situation is playing out on the ground in Tokyo. This is Tokyo's iconic Shibuya Crossing. I remember the first time I came here, it's breathtaking how packed this is pretty much any time of the day or night. Tokyo is now under a state of emergency and there are noticeably fewer people here, but people are still out. And a lot of those who come here are foreign tourists. And we know that tourism here in Japan has essentially evaporated because of the coronavirus pandemic. Let's check out some other areas more popular with the locals. Now I'm in Ebisu. This is a very happening Tokyo neighborhood and you can see most of the businesses here are open. This is a food court. It's uh, more than halfway full, and I'm seeing a lot of restaurants, mom and pop shops, there's a pet shop, there's an electronic store, all staying open, despite the fact that the Japanese government has said they only want basic economic activity continued. They want to cut the number of human to human contact by 70 to 80%. 
but this is looking just like a typical weekday afternoon. It's the beginning of the evening rush here at Shinagawa Station and people are starting to file out of the office and head home. Are these numbers smaller than a normal day? Probably. Are they a 70 to 80 percent reduction in the workforce? Definitely not. And that's what Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says needs to happen to prevent a catastrophe here in Tokyo, to prevent this city from seeing 10,000 cases of coronavirus within two weeks, 80,000 cases within a month. That would be catastrophic here because they have a shortage of ventilators. They have a shortage of ICU beds. But for a lot of people, it's just not possible to work from home. In fact, government data from last year shows 80 percent of Japanese companies do not have the ability to let people telework. So for a lot of these folks, they may not have a choice. Yes, it's a state of emergency, but for many people in Tokyo, it's business as usual. Will Ripley, CNN, Tokyo. Staying active and looking after one's mental health is one of the challenges that people throughout this whole period are facing. Here's how one Swiss-based yoga teacher is trying to help by giving free Instagram classes to those who are in lockdown in Italy. Sono in quarantena da ormai tre settimane. Questa, io sono uscita oggi appunto per fare un po' di spesa, vedi proprio la paura nelle persone. La, e secondo me anche quando ci diranno forse un giorno possiamo togliere tutte mascherine, guanti, secondo me ci rimarrà un po', la, un po questa cosa, perché essendo comunque un virus non, è fatica da andare proprio a dettagliare. Mi, mi ha veramente cambiato tanto, ma riscoprire anche proprio il valore delle persone, anche proprio nelle chiamate che fai. At the beginning of my lesson, I try always to bring people to a concentration and to take the mind away from the problem that we are living now. Benefit in this situation are you can take movement with your body, better, uh, better blood circulation and also uh, strengthen the muscles. Don't forget, you can simply head over to our website, cnnmoney.ch, for all of the latest content and interviews. In the meantime, take care, stay safe. I'm Olivia Chang, good evening.